Thanks, Pete. It's really great to have you here. Um, as Pete has said, over these lunch times, we're looking at some of the big questions of faith. Um, and today, we're looking at this question behind me, emotional, is there meaning in my pain? I just want to say that we appreciate this is a personal and potentially difficult topic. And because of that, we've got a team of guys in the navy blue human jumpers um, who will be around after the talk. Many of them work for local churches, and they're really used to be being a listening ear. So if you would like to grab one of them afterwards and just chat, um, have them listen to you, they will be really happy to do that. They're not professional counsellors, but they'll be really happy to sit and listen with you and potentially pray if that's something that you would like. In a minute, I'm going to hand over to Pete, um, who's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes, and after that, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, please do be texting in questions um, during the talk to the number behind me. And you say about Lou's, there's Lou's at the back, out of the door where you came in. Um, and also, if there's a fire, which we hope there isn't, we've got one door fire exit to my left here. There's two at the back and two through the cafe where you came in. But for the moment, I'm going to hand over to Pete. Thanks very much. Thanks, Cyril. There's still quite a lot of people coming in. So if you're on a row and there are gaps in between where you're sat, do you mind just scooting along so that those who are just arriving will be able to have a seat? Great. As uh, Sophia said, um, this week we're considering what it means to be human. And today we come to one of the most fundal, fundamental aspects of the human experience, which is pain. I think we can think of pain as being the Durham Cathedral of human experiences. What do I mean by that? I mean that we may well live as though we are masters of our own destiny, but when we suffer, it's like when you suddenly find yourself standing next to the cathedral. You're cut down to size. You have to uh, reevaluate your sense of scale. And also, just like Durham Cathedral, suffering towers over us. We may think that we're walking down some little back alleyway, but then we come out and there it stands again, towering. All of us sat here this lunchtime have pain and suffering in our stories ahead. Sobering to think that in 50 years' time, if we reconvened this group, the range of stories that we would share. And so given pain's inevitability within the human experience, we just cannot afford not to engage with questions of the nature of suffering and how to live in a world of pain. Each of us needs to grapple with how best to suffer ourselves and how best to serve others who are in pain. Now, this lunchtime, I'm going to suggest that despite the well-rehearsed objection to do with God's existence uh, in the presence of suffering, which I'll just briefly touch on later, the Christian story offers the best resources for suffering well and for drawing alongside the suffering. In other words, we might put it this, this way, that knowing Jesus frees us to be most human in a world of pain. But first, I want us to consider meaning. The exact title I was given today is, Is There Meaning in My Pain? Now, the, human, uh, the need for humans to find meaning in pain is an established idea. It was Nietzsche who first coined the statement that he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And that principle is illustrated in, I guess, the trivial ways in which we willingly embrace pain in certain situations, in the gym or on a diet. Around those activities, the cliches just tumble off our tongues, don't they? No pain, no gain. Discipline equals freedom. The greater goal, the why, allows us to bear and even embrace a how. Pain, whether that's a rumbling tummy or aching muscles. But of course the question then comes, what about the times when pain, when suffering invade as unwanted guests? Is there meaning in unchosen pain? And I want us to start interrogating this theme by, uh, with the eminent psychiatrist Viktor Frankl. I think his picture may pop up behind me. Frankl was an amazing guy. In his early 20s, he spent time in four different concentration camps during the Second World War, including Auschwitz. And deprived there of food and warmth, uh, space and clothing, Frankel watched human life degenerate to a basic struggle for survival. And yet he noticed that even in that hellish environment, 
most people still chose life over death. Frankel says that those who could find nothing to live for soon died. But the majority of people, those who are committed to fighting for another day, sat, found some sort of meaning that gave them hope to go on. And, and Frankel says often that was supported by something concrete that, that gave them meaning or hope, maybe a memory of a kind act or a memento from a loved one or a verse from the Bible. I was sharing this story with some family members of mine, and they told me about my own great uncle Charlie, who was taken a prisoner of war by the Japanese in Burma in the Second World War. In between the uh, padding and the sole of his shoe, he hid a grainy photo of a girl back home. And when his guards weren't watching, he would take this photo out. And he later said that it was that photo that allowed him to keep going. Interestingly, it didn't matter that when he got back to the UK, she'd met somebody else. And in fact, he soon married somebody else too. But just holding that photo gave him meaning to persevere. You see the same thing in uh, my favorite TV documentary from last year, Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. Do watch it on all four if you missed it. You might know that a nursery was relocated into an old people's home, and the elderly people were encouraged to get involved in relationships and activities with these four-year-old kids. And all of a sudden, it was as if these elderly people had meaning in their lives. And the effect was incredible and measurable on both their health and their all-round well-being. The point is this. To be human... We have to live as though our lives have meaning. We have to live as though there is a reason for getting out of bed in the morning, even when life is, is at its very worst. But you see, that's also why when suffering invades and the dreams that we'd previously held are somewhat dashed, we're forced to reevaluate. We're forced to ask whether the meaning that we uh, held before really is enough in our new context of pain. Almost certainly the times in your life when you've experienced the most deep pain have also been the times in which questions about meaning have been unlocked. You find yourself asking about what really matters and the more desperate your suffering is, the more primal these questions become. What am I here for? Does my suffering count for anything? Or maybe just why? Born in the UK to Indian parents, the author Pico Ayer has lived also in the United States and Japan. And he notes that in as much as different world cultures find different meanings in different big stories, they are able and they respond to suffering, suffering differently. In Buddhist influence, Japan, for example, he notes that suffering is used as a positive force to wean us away from over-reliance upon ourselves. And so when disaster strikes, the response in Japan is very different from the West. Here's how he describes it. I'll do my best, and I'll stick it out, and it can't be helped are phrases you hear every hour in Japan. When a tsunami claimed thousands of lives north of Tokyo two years ago, I heard more lamentation and panic in California than among the people I knew around Kyoto. Why should Western people be more troubled about suffering than those in Japan? Isn't the answer... Because those in the West don't have an embracing enough meaning to life. The meaning we ascribe to life doesn't have broad enough shoulders over which we can drape our pain. Or as Nietzsche put it, we don't have a big enough why. And so there are all sorts of hows that we struggle to bear. Recently, I was on the Humanist UK website watching their new series of videos uh, narrated by Stephen Fry. And one is all about uh, death, and here's how it closes. 
It says this, death is a natural part of life. It makes sense for us to try not to be afraid of it, but instead to come to terms with it. Then we can focus instead on finding meaning and purpose in the here and now, making the most of the one life we know we have. Now, I guess whilst many here won't self-identify as humanists, that statement nevertheless summarizes our culture's, culture's big story very well, that given we can't be sure of anything else, we should make the most of the one life that we know we have. You must find your meaning in this world now. But do you see also by implication that limits the meaning of our pain and suffering to this world now, too. That makes the Western cultural story quite different from many others. See, in Japan, suffering can bring you to a positive outcome, a goal that's achieved not only despite suffering, but through suffering, and so suffering never triumphs. But within our culture's big story, suffering always triumphs, at least when the story is told consistently. If all you've got is three score years plus ten, suffering can never be a good chapter, only an interruption to it. And suffering can't ever take you anywhere. It just withholds you from getting that which you want most. See, in our culture's big story, suffering always wins. And that seems to take us away from a true experience of humanity and not into it. Now, I think implicitly some of us just adopt a bigger story. We don't talk about it, but we implicitly adopt a bigger story, which is something along these lines. Let, let it be the making of you. Let it do something good to you. Grit your teeth, be brave, be strong, see what comes of it got to say there are some significant problems though with that approach I want to tiptoe carefully here but it's tragic for example isn't it that children who suffer six or more traumatic experiences die on average 20 years sooner than those who have a peaceful childhood doesn't that cut against the idea that good inevitably comes from bad? The truth is that not only do terrible things happen, but they also condemn some people to a further lifetime of future pain. Perhaps even more problematically, the let this be the making of you approach doesn't easily lead itself for you to show compassion to those who are in pain. TV presenter Simon Thomas, she used to present Blue Peter, Sky Sports now, recently lost his wife to a rare form of blood cancer just four days after her diagnosis. And now Simon Thomas is left as a single parent with an eight-year-old son. And he's spoken of how many people, no doubt with good motives, no doubt with good motives, have encouraged him to be strong. But he says, actually, to try and be strong in this moment is a leap from reality. In fact, he says in being forced to be strong, he feels as though he's being cheated of the opportunity to grieve. And in being cheated of the opportunity to grieve, he feels that his relationship with his late wife is being devalued. And so he writes, all I can do at the moment is unclinch those fists, stop trying to be strong, and say to people, no, this is me. And this is what grief looks like. I've got to say, in fact, the let this be the making of your approach to suffering isn't very different from that which dominated before the rise of Christianity. And yet, soon after Jesus, Christianity had widely supplanted it. Why? 
Luc Ferry is an atheist and he's a uh, philosophy professor in Paris. He puts it like this. Christian thought gained the upper hand over Greek thought and dominated Europe until the Renaissance. This is no small achievement. There must surely be reasons for this hegemony, he goes on. In fact, Christians came up with answers to human questions about mortality, which have no equivalent in Greek thought. Answers so successful, if you like, so attractive and so indispensable that they convinced a large proportion of humanity. Now, what is it that makes the Christian response to pain so different and so attractive? I want to illustrate Faree's answer by looking at one, of, one episode from Luke's Gospel. You might like to pick it up and turn to page 18. Luke's Gospel is uh, the eyewitness account of Jesus' life uh, that we're looking at this week. So do turn to page 18. And we're going to read from little uh, number 11, which is on the left-hand column. It says this. It's entitled, Jesus Raises a Widow's Son. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. This illustrates the first part of what Faris says is so appealing in the Christian story that the sovereign God himself is acquainted with suffering and pain. See, within Greek thought, if God was there, he was blind and he was distant, an anonymous form of fate, not unlike the way that some of us will tend to think about God. But the earliest followers of Jesus became convinced that he was the creator God in the flesh. One of the accounts of Jesus' life has one of Jesus' disciples upon meeting the resurrected Jesus saying, my Lord and my God. And so the Christian conviction is that God took on human flesh and vulnerability. And that's what we see in this account. God knows what it's like to have to look a grieving woman in the eye. And we're told that when Jesus meets this woman, it's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? His heart went out to her. Jesus also knew personal suffering. Read through Luke's gospel and you will see Jesus hungry, thirsty, lonely, and misunderstood. And the whole account builds towards Jesus' brutal death, a painful death like no other. The point is this. Within the Christian story, Whatever the depth of your suffering, the Christian God knows and he empathizes. Now, at the very least, do you see how that changes the context of how we grapple with how a sovereign God can allow suffering? There aren't any easy answers to that question. But if Jesus really is the sovereign God, it can't be because he's oblivious to pain. And it can't be because he doesn't care. The second part of Christianity's answer is foreshadowed in what happens next from the, number 14. Jesus went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. See, it turns out that when Jesus says don't cry, he's not like those trying to comfort Simon Thomas. Rather, Jesus is telling this woman that he has the ability to transform her pain. That those are who are with Jesus need not grieve like those who have no hope. And so Jesus dramatically brings the funeral procession to a halt. 
And then he touches the bier, the kind of coffin thing on which the body is carried. And in doing so, it's as if Jesus reclaims this one who has been marked out for death. And then do you notice that things happen thick and fast? Jesus addresses the dead boy. Young man, I say to you, get up. Then you get one of the Bible's most remarkable phrases. The dead man sat up. Followed by... one of the most tender. Jesus gave him back to his mother. And so here is the hope that Jesus offers a hurting world in microcosm, a foreshadowing of what he will one day do for all creation and all those who trust him, physical resurrection. See, with Jesus, relationships that end all too soon need not end forever. And Jesus is committed to bringing about this ending. Don't have time to describe this now. Ask a bit in the questions. But this happy ever after was secured at the cost of Jesus' own life. Through his own death, Jesus gives death a death blow. And that means that life now need not end with earthly death, something which Jesus demonstrates through his own physical resurrection. Now, not only is this a beautiful vision for the future, it can also make suffering meaningful now. Because throughout the Bible story, we're encouraged that our response to suffering now is part of what transforms us to be the people that we were made to be. See, Christians trust in the God of the cross to be remaking them and bringing pain in the midst of, bringing blessing in the midst of pain to others. Even in the hottest of furnaces, knowing that God is working out purposes that will last eternally. Now, as I said earlier, Luke Ferry isn't a Christian, but he sees the attraction of this. He acknowledges the Christian response is without question the most effective of all responses it would seem to be the only version of salvation that enables us not only to transcend the fear of death but also to beat death itself elsewhere Fari admits that this truth claim hinges on whether or not Jesus was physically resurrected and he's absolutely right he says he can't believe it we'll see on Friday there are good reasons to believe it. But those who do subscribe to this story then find new resources to also show compassion. The sociologist Rodney Stark, who at the time wasn't a Christian, though he's later become a Christian, in his research found that Christians vastly exceeded Roman pagans in offering practical compassion. During an epidemic, for example, in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, many well-known pagan doctors ran away to safety, whereas many Christians stayed to take care of the sick and dying. Why? Stark says because they knew that they had a God whose heart goes out to the suffering. They knew that their hearts ought to be similarly aligned, but also they were given the resources of a greater hope. He writes this. The pagans lacked belief in life beyond death. The Christians were certain that this life was but prelude. For the pagans to have remained to treat the afflicted would have required bravery far beyond that needed by the Christians to do likewise. Belief in the resurrection of Jesus banishes fear and allows Christians to show deep compassion, just like their God. And that same conviction causes Christians around the world today to give their hearts out to the suffering too. Do you know what? I hope you've seen echoes of that amongst your Christian friends in Durham, who've stayed to show compassion, even when it costs them. And in doing so, let me submit, they are demonstrating true humanity. 
we started by saying that being human requires us to live as though meaning exists in the midst of pain. All of us need to have a meaning to suffer well and to be able to help the suffering. This lunchtime, I'd like to commend that the Christian story is the only meaning that resonates with reality and which can free you to comfort others with authentic hope. So I think. Thank you, Pete, so much for sharing on that. Thank you, you guys, also, who have texted in questions. We really appreciate it. Um, we're not going to have that long. We're going to have about 10 minutes, and we'll break it 10 to 2. Um, but I'm going to try and get through a couple while we can. Thanks. Um, we've got a question about, at the beginning of your talk, you're talking about the guy in the Japanese camp, mm. which says, about the story of a prisoner of war in a Japanese camp, the photo gave him meaning, but it had no objective value. It kept him going, but after the war, the photo was meaningless. So... Do we conclude that human will is, sorry, so do we conclude that the human will is that powerful and it doesn't matter what we believe in? I mean, we certainly see the power of psychology, don't we? Um, that's, the, that's the first thing that we would want to say. And um, in Frankel's book, Man's Search for Meaning, I was just reading it again this morning, got my copy over there if you want to have a look at it. We see that um, the smallest thing can often be used to, given, to give humans hope. Um, I, what I, I suppose I've been trying to say in the, midst of, uh, in the midst of this, though, is that when it comes to the context of one's whole life, and when it comes particularly to dealing with pain, which is not just episodic, you know, pain which goes on, the context of the whole of life, we do find that, that we have to, if we're to suffer well and to comfort others well, we have to have a pretty large meaning um, that, we, uh, that we look to to help us. Um, and actually, there are a fairly limited number of um, options um, which keep emerging within different world cultures um, you could look at your Christian friend and you could say do you know what this is all just a psychological crutch psychological arguments aren't very good because they can just be turned around um, uh, the person who poisons one person who claims that one person's thinking is poisoned all, all the other person has to say is, say, well, no, the reason why you think what you do is because of your psychology, and that gets us nowhere. Actually, what we then have to do is to have a look at the objective reasons for believing something. Okay, And that's what we're seeking to do this week, to say that Christianity is not only existentially satisfying, but it's also rationally credible. There aren't many other societies this week on campus or this year on campus that are encouraging you to think this much, are there? And that's because we believe that the Christian answer stands up to scrutiny. And so you could dismiss this as psychological crutch or you could look at the evidence. You may still ultimately come to the, the conclusion, as Luke Ferry did, that it's positive psychology. I would humbly submit, though, that there's more to it than something that can just be dismissed in that way. Thanks, Pete. I hope that's helpful for that. I had a few questions on that kind of topic, um, so do come back if you'd like to. Um, I would like to open up the floor to questions. We've got James here with a roving mic, so if anyone would like to stick up a hand um, and have your question answered, then feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, we'll go back to the phone. That's fine. Um, but yeah, if you want to make it a discussion, then feel free to stick up a hand um, and we can do that. I'll stick with the phone for now. Um, we've got a question saying, if God has created us and loves us, why would he create us with illnesses and other things that make life painful and difficult? Um, those of us who were here yesterday would have thought about what we said about the Bible. It's a story, okay? And it claims to tell the objective truth of universal life and everything from eternity past to eternity future. 
what we realize is that, so some, some accounts um, hold a pretty static understanding of what reality is like. Atheism would be one of those, that whilst technically atheism would look to a beginning and an end, um, the practical um, emphasis is just that we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world where suffering and death always have been, suffering and death always will be, and suffering and death um, will win. Within Christianity, the story of the universe is made up of a whole number of different acts. And so those of you who've read the Bible may know that um, the first two chapters of the Bible talk about the nature of the cosmos as it was created to be. And in those, on, on that day, there was no disease, there was no death. All of those things which we feel today don't instinctively have a place in the universe, didn't have a place in the universe on that day. And yet what the Bible talks about is that as humanity has walked out on relationship with the author of life, with the living God, not only has that led to chaos within us, it's, left to, it's led to chaos in the universe as well. And therefore, um, God didn't, um, God's, God's ultimate vision for humanity is not that we suffer, it's not that we die, which is why the Bible story begins without suffering and death and ends without suffering and death. Now there's a much bigger answer to why within this era we suffer and we die. But do you see how that dignifies those moments today when you feel this isn't right? I was talking with someone yesterday, one of the most significant moments in my life was as a sixth former when a friend of mine, Ben, was knocked off his motorbike one weekend and, and didn't come in on Monday morning. I remember really clearly thinking, what, what's going to happen when the teacher gets down to Ben's name in the register? And he just paused briefly and he moved on. I remember a group of us, 17-year-olds, huddled together in the rain in the creme, remembering Ben's life. And in that moment, we all felt, this is a rupture. This is awful. Death has no place here. And the Bible says that deep intuition that you have is not down to mere psychology. As a, we'll think on Friday, as one ancient sage puts it in the Bible, that we have eternity set within our hearts. So I'd love to say more about that, but you'll see that a lot of these questions can't have soundbite answers. And so I really hope that Lots of people can stay after two o'clock and we'll dig into them a little further. Thanks for that, Pete. I'd just like to emphasize that. Um, if that's you know, hit anything home with you, um, please do stay around. Please do talk to us. Um, we would love to talk to you about that. I'm going to finish with one last question, um, if that's okay. Um, it's kind of a clarification from earlier on. Um, Jesus said, don't cry. Yeah. Isn't that the equivalent to be strong? The answer which you explained well to be untrue to a person's real feelings and takes away from the relationship that you've had with the person. Yeah, I really hope that that person texted that between when I first read it and then when I explained it afterwards. The be strong camp are just saying, look, grit your teeth, make the best of this. That is not what Jesus is saying. In fact, don't cry would seem to be about the most inappropriate thing you can say at a funeral, isn't it? Jesus is not saying, be strong, don't cry, be stoic. Jesus is saying, you need not weep as though what has just happened will be that forever because I'm about to transform your future. I, I mentioned in passing one Bible verse which talks about how Christians are encouraged to grieve but not as those who have no hope. I find that so helpful. We're encouraged to grieve. I don't have to suppress that part of hum my humanity because actually our emotions are one way of telling us what the world is really like. So I'm encouraged to grieve, but at the same time, I don't have to grieve as one without hope because I believe that Jesus is alive and active in the world and that he has a plan for ending everything 
which causes us to cry and to weep today. The amazing thing, though, is that we are invited into that future too, if only we'll entrust ourselves to him. He's the one who secured our forgiveness, who's raised to life for us, so that however many tears you have caused in the life of someone else, you too, by right, one by blood, can have a place in that future without tears, a place where you'll never, ever cause somebody to cry again and where your own tears will be wiped away. Thank you, Pete, and um, I hope that that is helpful. We're going to break now. If you need to get away for lectures, um, we're going to have a two-minute break so that you can do that. Um, if you can stay, we would love you to stay. We're going to have a yeah, much longer question time. Can I flag up a couple of things? Um, we would love to hear from you guys. There are connect cards on your seats or on your tables. Um, please do just grab one of those um, and fill it in for us. There are going to be stewards on the exits um, who will be having boxes for those. Please also take away Luke's Gospels. Um, our cafe will be open all afternoon, um, so please do yeah, um, hang out there. If you do need to leave, we'd encourage you to leave quickly. There are two exits in the cafe and at the back of the marquee. There's also a far exit at the front, which we're going to open for about 30 seconds. If you need to get out of there, um, please do move, and we'll come back together in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay, guys, we're going to kick off again. As I said, if you would like to move forward so that you can hear better, please do. Um, but yeah, thank you. Pete, we've got another question here, which um, we didn't really touch on that much. Some Christians will say that suffering exists because of human, sinf human sinfulness, but how does that explain things like natural disasters? Okay, let me... Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, Christians uh, will say that suffering finds its root in human sin. I'll clarify what that means in just a moment. Um, but what about things like disease, natural disasters, those sorts of things? Um, first of all, let me just clarify what is meant by sin, um, because I think that word is misunderstood um, uh, in a whole number of cultures. Um, I know that in Chinese, it's often translated as the word crime, and that's not a good uh, translation of that word. But also within our culture, we tend to think of sin as being things which, you know, just a bit naughty but nice. Actually, uh, what, what the Bible means by sin is the inner ability that all of us has to take a really good and beautiful thing and to do something dreadful with it. Um, uh, so, you know, I can break a good mood, somebody else's good mood just like that. I can break a friendship easily. Um, all of these things which are good and beautiful, I have the capacity to, um, to make ugly. Um, and that comes uh, out of, ultimately, living out of relationship with God. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, when you stop to think about it, the suffering that other people have caused you. And then you think very plausibly you have done exactly the same thing to other people, sometimes deliberately, but sometimes just thoughtlessly, that actually each of us are part of the disease and not just the cure when it comes to the pains of the world. And so some of the pain in the world we can very easily attribute to human volition. Somebody did something thoughtless, somebody did something awful, and it had consequences. And very often that's true even when it comes to things that appear to be like uh, more associated with, with natural causes. You know, the fact that drought and famine kills quite the number of people that it does can't just be ascribed to natural causes but also to corrupt regimes and to human selfishness and that sort of thing as well. But there are still some forms of suffering which clearly are not attributable to any sort of human volition at all. And I suppose I began to touch on this when, and there is, there is real mystery involved here. Um, but the Bible says that humanity is like unlike anything else that God has made, that we bear abilities and capacities like nothing else in all of creation. Um, 
And one of the ways in which uh, the Bible talks about humans relating to everything else that God has made is that we're to steward it. Um, We're to care for it. We're to draw out its potential. Now, as I say, there is real mystery involved here. But as the kind of linchpin, the cornerstone almost of everything that God has made, when humanity fractures, everything else fractures as well. When chaos enters into the human heart, chaos enters into absolutely everything else that God has made as well. And therefore, it's not as if when a natural disaster happens, as, and, and you know, this, is, this is awful when this occurs. Um, some people try to look for a direct cause for that suffering. I remember some maniac saying that you know, when the tsunami happened, God was particularly judging the nations of those that were the most adversely affected. The, the Bible would say, run away from that um, answer by a mile. Yet nevertheless, as we look at the world and as we see disease and death, one of the phrases that the Bible uses to describe the world that we live in now is that it's in slavery to decay. I mean, just let that metaphor sit on your heart for a minute. The world is in slavery to decay. And yet ultimately, this is why Jesus' answer to the problem of suffering is dealt through his death on the cross. Because if he's to deal with suffering at its root cause, he must deal with humanity. All of our sin, all of our chaos, all of our brokenness at its root cause. But then having dealt with the universe's brokenness at its root cause, that then offers hope not just to humanity, but also to the entire cosmos as well. That's why the Christian hope of eternity is not that we'll float away from our bodies into some ethereal existence elsewhere, but that it will be this present cosmos which is transformed, but bears none of the scars and none of the slavery to decay and chaos that it has today. Now, I realize that answer is both satisfying and unsatisfying, or Actually, if I might put it like this, I think you can find it satisfying, but not fulfilling. You know the Latin word satis, enough. There's enough for you, but you are not full up. Okay, it will only be, on some of these questions of suffering, it will only be an eternity future that will find the answer fulfilling. But for the moment, these answers are satisfying. They're enough to enable you to suffer well and to comfort those who are in pain, even in pain which seems to have been caused by no one else. Thanks, Pete. I'm going to come to the floor in a minute. Um, I'd love to just do one more question um, on the phone that I've got. I hope that you're still here because thank you very much for texting this in. Um, it's a question which says, what about the suffering that the human, that, sorry, what about the suffering that the Christian faith administers, such as the exclusion of homosexuals, and the model of the patriarchy that sidelines women from preaching. If this is you, I'd love to talk to you face to face. But let me just say one or two things. The first is, um, as a subset of humanity, there is no doubt that Christians have been part of the disease and not the cure when it comes to suffering that's been undertaken. And, And ultimately, not just in these examples, but in many other ways. And whilst in some ways it's unfair for us to have higher expectations of Christians, because Christians are ultimately humans, given that a Christian claims to speak for the living God of compassion, it's also right to some extent 
that the watching world has higher expectations of Christians. There is no doubt that Christians have hurt and continue to hurt many people in profound ways. And for that, I want to say sorry, not because I feel as though I am a person who has the authority to speak on the part of billions of Christians, but because I am a subset of that group. And again, I have hurt people through my self-righteousness, through my thoughtlessness, through my competitive spirit, through a whole number of other things. I would say to you that actually the Christian story makes more sense of what we feel about Christian guilt actually than pretty much any other story, but maybe that's for another day. And so if you feel as though you have been hurt by another Christian, it's right for me to feel compassion for you. And do you know what? Regardless of whoever that was, there will be other people in the room who feel, I bear a scar which is tender to touch that was inflicted by a Christian or Christians. For some people, it's been really hard even for you to come here today because of that. And you know what? To some extent, in as much other, as other Christians have hurt me, I want to say I know how that feels. When it comes to those particular things that were mentioned, I little want to defer to what was said yesterday. Okay, and it is this. That there is no doubt that the Bible says some things which are on the face of it are not only counterintuitive but also massively countercultural. And we also said yesterday that if you're reading the Bible, and there's a particular onus on you if you're a Christian here, is to understand what the Bible actually says when it addresses some of those issues. Because all of us, as we've said throughout the week, are interpreters. All of us have to make sense of not only what we read, but what we see in the world as well. And so if you're a Christian, the onus is on you to interpret it well now. To some extent, I think I will want to keep those two issues that were mentioned apart. Um, the Bible does say some re very revolutionary things about gender, and I think, but I think sometimes they've been very heavy-handedly abused, either by those who haven't taken the time to hear what the Bible has to say according to its own voice, or to prop up some other sort of agenda. When it comes to the issue of sexuality, when it comes to the issue of human relationships more broadly, and, mari and, mari and even what it means to be human, the Bible is massively countercultural. And it seems to me that if that's the Bible's voice, and if those words are inspired by a God that loves us, it's not wrong for Christians to cling to them and to look to them as a means for human flourishing. Where Christians do go wrong, and let's face it, again, I'm not speaking abstractly here, sometimes I've been guilty of this as well, is I've taken something that the Bible says which is ultimately for good, which is for flourishing, and which is kind, but I've used it to bludgeon somebody else without any sort of compassion and empathy. Now, as I said yesterday, every single Christian you know that reads the Bible and has half a brain will read bits of it with a lump in their throat. But sometimes we forget what that feels like when we're addressing someone who doesn't have quite the same story as us. And so as Christians, we have good reason for looking to the Bible for ultimate truth. But that absolutely needs to be spoken about and lived in a way 
that's compassionate and attractive. Because ultimately, I believe in a God who has a very high standard of truth. Jesus absolutely has a high standard of truth, but never wields it in a way that isn't accompanied by the deepest of compassion. And so maybe if, if you want to chat for I, it's difficult to say more and much about this because I don't, even here, there's a danger that we talk past each other because we lack an empathy for each other. This sort of conversation is much easier face to face. So do talk to somebody in a blue jumper or, or come and speak to me afterwards if, if you would like to. Thanks, Pete. Um, we're going to continue with questions. Um, it's worth saying a lot of these questions are really difficult. They're difficult for me to read, difficult for you to hear. Um, but thank you for keeping text them in. Would somebody um, like to say anything from the floor? Because you're very welcome to. Um, if you'd like to stick up a hand, um, prioritise your question, chat to Pete. Um, otherwise, I have got plenty, so thank you. Um, going on to one which says... Where is it? How do you account for suffering of young children before they've had the chance to op opt into Christianity? How does God account for the pain and suffering of those so young? Let me say two things here. One is to refer to the previous answer about chaos in the universe. And therefore, there are certain things that I can say to that end, but not very many. I don't want this to sound like public therapy, but this is a question which is important in my story. Um, taking my two sons out of the equation, we lost in miscarriage four children between the birth of my first son and the birth of my second son. And we lost one of them late, relatively speaking, in pregnancy. And so, this question resonates. What I said earlier is, if Jesus really is God, do you know what? I am convinced that Jesus is God. And I'm convinced then that if here is a God who is willing to suffer and to go to the cross, whatever the answer to that question is, there are certain things that I can just strike out as possibilities. And it's not that he doesn't love. And it's not that he doesn't care. I don't believe that we lost those four babies because Jesus doesn't love me or that Jesus doesn't love my wife or even that Jesus didn't love those unborn children. And I do know that he was the closest. We had many friends. Our church were amazing. People all, all over the place were, were incredible for us. But the closest friend of all in that was, was Jesus. There's a conversation between Abraham and God in the Old Testament, which is somewhat about this question. And it's both kind of resolved and unresolved because the resolution is that Abraham declares, will not the God of the world do rightly? Do you know what? 
I believe Jesus is the God of the world. And there are so many people that I would not trust with the tenderest parts of my heart. Because I think they would have the tendency to be heavy-handed or to walk all over them. Do you know what? When it comes to the deepest pain in my life, including these deep questions, there is no one I would rather entrust them to than Jesus of Nazareth. Read the gospel. See his character. See his care. See his commitment. See his sacrifice. See his blood. See his victory over the grave and then tell me that God does not care for you. Yeah. Um, I've got a follow-up question that someone's just texting at the moment saying... Why should I give my life to a God who allows me and my family to experience so much pain? The short answer is because if you walk away from him, you abandon any sort of hope. And because he loves you. Thank you, Pete. Um, we're going to keep going till about half past two. Um, if you do need to slip out as we're doing it, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to keep going because I've got lots of questions. So thanks. There's been lots of discussion about pain caused by an event or circumstance. What about chronic pain like long-term mental health issues or pain like social justice caused by structural inequalities? The type of pain that stays is distributed very unequally in society. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. That's true, isn't it? Again, I would say the Bible explains human nature. And why we're so good at creating such ugly structures more than any sociological text I ever read <laughs> when I was doing my master's. And so the evil structures of the world don't cast God by, su by surprise. You find them described in the Bible. This is the real world that the Bible describes. I mean, Mark would be a brilliant one to chat to about this. He has had a lot of experience with global organizations and regimes that have caused intolerable sorrow. I do want to put my hands up and say that Christians, I, so I, I said earlier that we believe we have a God whose heart goes out in compassion to those in pain. We all have our own blinkers. And it probably is fair to say that Christians have been more aware and more actively engaged in seeing that pain in certain situations than in others. Um, I do think that some of the most pioneering and compassionate work being done in mental health and in global structures of injustice is being done by Christians. But some of that work has been too little and it's been too late. Part of that is just reflective of the, cult of the categories that we all use in culture. Christians breathe the same air as everybody else. But actually, the church has been culpable for some of that as well. But ultimately, all forms of suffering, include, uh, including those, are described by and are addressed by the Bible's big story. 
there isn't a different reason for chronic suffering than there is for acute suffering. There isn't a different reason for mental health struggles over physical health struggles. All of those are dignified. All of them are addressed. And all of them are provided with hope in the Christian big story centering on Jesus' death and resurrection.